Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Marshall, and I'm the uh, head of exhibitions and programs at the George Eastman Museum. Welcome to today's virtual talk with landscape manager Dan Bellavia and assistant conservator Sarah Casto. They will be giving us a behind the scenes look at some of the original blueprints from George Eastman's uh, historic estate. And Dan is going to guide us through some of the history of the landscape. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about how it exists today. And Sarah will be discussing her recent conservation efforts on one of these unique blueprints uh, in order to preserve it for future generations. If you have questions at any point throughout today's talk, please submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Uh, I, I always say at the bottom, it also might be at the top too. So uh, it kind of depends on what device you're using. Um, at the end of Dan and Sarah's talk, we'll go through as many of your questions that we have time for. The chat function is open, but we won't be monitoring it for questions related to the talk. Uh, if you do have, or if you want to just stop in, say hi in the chat, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from, uh, or just kind of chat with each other through there. Uh, uh, feel free to use the chat for that, but if you do have uh, questions specifically for the presenters, please uh, submit them through the Q&A box. We are recording today's webinar. We'll be putting it on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks, so if you'd like to go back and watch it again or share with others, you'll be able to access it along with our other webinars and video content through YouTube. Uh, you should also be getting an email in about a week uh, with a link to it as well. Uh, so we have closed captioning, uh, the Zoom's closed captioning function turned on. Uh, if you'd like to turn it off, you can, you should be able to click on the closed caption icon, CC icon. Um, again, that's either probably at the top or bottom of your screen uh, and disable it. And I should note that while Zoom's closed captioning is a really amazing feature to have, it sometimes is not the most accurate at interpretation, particularly with some of the technical language. Uh, that we're often using in these types of talks related to photography or uh, in this case, maybe some conservation treatments. So you may see a little inconsistency with that. Um, but happy to have it. Happy to have you all here, as I was saying, on this unbelievably beautifully warm day in Rochester, if that's where you're tuning in from. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dan Bellavia, who will get us started. Dan. Thank you, Nick. Okay, welcome to Best Laid Plans. It's a collaboration that Sarah and I put together um, to give people an idea. One, we were taking care of a blueprint and having it fixed, and we thought this was a nice way to show people some of the things that go on here, some of the things that went on in Eastman's time, and how we can bring the things that went on in George Eastman's time to the present. So what we'll be going through today is how Eastman planned and built his estate. And then we'll talk a little bit about the original blueprints and how some of that affects what goes on here uh, normally throughout the years that have, the museum has been going on. Okay, George Eastman. Most people are familiar with him. Come the turn of the century, he was living down the street in, in the Sewell house and wanted to have his own farm. He had always been a farm person, wanted to be able to have an estate where he could be self-sufficient um, and spent quite a bit of time in 1900, 1901, starting to look for some property. As it went on, he kept looking at a few different places around the city. Uh, and in June of 2000, turn it, come on, hold on. There we go. In, in, in June of 1901, he received a letter from his uh, lawyer stating that he had spoken with Mr. Culver, had a piece of property on East Avenue, was approximately eight and a half acres, and that he was willing to sell it. Um, this is the original letter he got from his lawyer. And it's interesting to note, it's a little tough to read, but they did things a little differently back then. Instead of buying things by the acre, you bought it a price per foot for whatever the frontage of the property was. Up in here, it's a little, if you can see it, where's my mouse? There we go. Um, Mr. Culver was asking $300 for each foot of frontage on East Avenue and $60 for each foot of frontage on Culver Park. Now, the first question I normally get is, what is Culver Park? 
Uh, back in 1900, University Avenue was not University Avenue. It was Culver Park. University Avenue actually was where Atlantic Avenue is now. So things have changed quite a bit. At this point, the property that Eastman was looking at was actually located at 350 University Avenue. Now it is 900. This property was changed about three times for the different numbers. As the city grew, they needed to get some more numbers. So things changed. But this letter states that Mr. Culver would like to sell the property and that he'd like to get $100,000 for it. Awful lot of money for eight acres. There was only eight and a half acres. Uh, nowadays, I'm sure it would be a steal, but back then seems to be an awful lot of money to have spent. So Eastman considered it. And four days later, he got another letter from his lawyer stating that uh, Culver seems to be ready to have Eastman to come over and take a look at it. But he advises Eastman he should probably sit down and talk with Mr. Culver because Mr. Culver's having some second thoughts. Uh, this was a family farm. This was his homestead. It had been his homestead for quite a while. And I can understand that as you're about to lose your family homestead, uh, having a little reservation to do it. <clears throat> Eastman did go over, did speak to him, and they were able to, to seal the deal. Uh, roughly about 10 days later, Eastman put out a notice that he did purchase the property and that he was going to take it over. So this is an original picture of the uh, Culver Homestead in the house, beautiful house that they had. Uh, this basically is closer to the street than the, the museum is or the, you know, the mansion is. But this is what it looked like at that point in 1901. Here's some more pictures. I'm going to go through and show you what the property actually looked like when Eastman took a look through it. He walked through. I'm not sure, but it's a very good possibility that the bike you see there is either his or his landscape architect, Ailing DeForest, who took these pictures for him. So here's the back piece of the property. Very good size. You see the trees in the back. Um, gives you an idea of how deep that property was when it was just a farm. It's a little difficult to tell how big the property is now, but if you are able to walk it, you can tell. It's a pretty good sized piece of property. So it had come with orchards. He had some fields planted, uh, corn, things like that, but it was a very unimproved property. And here you can see where he had his vegetable gardens. And one of the things I love to notate in this picture in particular is you see this structure in the back. Uh, when Eastman was looking at purchasing the property, Gleason's wasn't on University Avenue. This is actually the original bicycle racetrack that was in Rochester and where the original baseball team played. Um, something that most people don't get to see. We've only been able to find two pictures with the, the property actually in there. But it's just a little note to see what was going on in the area at that point. You can take a look. This is a picture looking from University Avenue towards East Avenue, how unimproved it was. This is what we now call Archive Drive or the drive that runs from the museum to the back of the property. So that, that road was still kept. So it gives you an idea of how unimproved the property was. Uh, a lot of work was to be done. So we go on to Eastman's plan. Like I said, he wanted a farm. He wanted to have a place to live. He was gonna be bringing his mother with him but there was a lot of work to be done on the property. So in 1902, a year later, before anything's done, he had a survey that was done of the property. And this survey here has been able for us for a, a thousand or a hundred year old document, we've been able to almost pinpoint what trees were kept on the property during Eastman's time and what are still alive now that were planted on the Culver homestead. And there are about four trees on the property right now that we can point to and know they were there in 1902 because of the notations that are on this survey. So a very good way for me to bring back from the past what's really here and how old some of the things are. So immediately, about 10 days later, after he signed the property and bought it, he hired his structural engineer, Jay Foster Warner. He was commissioned to build the architectural plans and to decide what they were going to put into the house. These things went pretty quick at that point. Um, this happens to be the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the blueprints that we're going to be talking about today. I set them up there just so you can see some of the original prints that were there. But within a month, he was commissioned to produce a model. Now, this is an actual model sitting on a table of Eastman's house. Um, it's not perfect. It's not to scale. Some of the things we see in it 
weren't necessarily done. So here's a front view. Here's a, this is an interesting one because this is a rear view and most people have never seen a lot of this. This back area, this back area right here was the original servant's porch. You can see the port cachere here, but all of this is now covered up with the wall of the Dryden. This whole cavity disappeared when they put the Dryden in, so you'll never be able to see it again. We have a few pictures that I've included in here to give you an idea of how it looked, but this would have been the back of the house. You can see where the terrace garden would be in here. You can see this is the uh, colonnade and where the palm house would sit. Here's a side view. Um, looks a little more closer to what people are used to. Now you have to remember too that this is before Eastman did some of his major construction later on. So the house doesn't look exactly the same. The floor to ceiling windows in the center of the picture, those aren't there, it's a little different. So this was just the model to give him an idea of what he really wanted to do. <coughs> Excuse me. His next step was to work on the landscape. As I said, he was gonna be a farming uh, landowner. Hired Ailing DeForest, a student of um, Olmsted, the guy who took care of uh, Central Park. So he was an up and coming person. And here, I, you know, oh, um, DeForest wasn't all that old. And I think this is where Eastman was one of those people that took care of not paying for things you didn't have to. Why hire the teacher when you can hire the student? Um, Ailing DeForest was a very capable architect, did some pretty neat things for the property. Um, but he was the one that they brought on to make all the master plans for the gardens. This is an, an original, early representation of what they felt they were going to build. It's a little hard to see because it is a rather old document, but it does show you where they were looking at putting gardens, where they were going to be putting the house, and how they were going to lay out the property. They took a look at a couple of different views of things. Here's another um, drawing of it. You can see it's complete. It's very different than what we have today. Um, the pergola is not there. He had a couple of other different structures he was putting in, these two here. Um, and he had it laid out a little differently than what we see now. Um, but as I said, these were renderings to try and decide what he really wanted. Um, this is a, a view from standing at the conservatory. Well, if you stand at the conservatory on the upper terrace, there's a set of stairs there. That building was never made. So these were the things they were going through, trying to determine really what did Eastman want? What was gonna make him comfortable in the building? And there were quite a few revisions before things really got going. This happens to be an original picture. Again, the, the, what I understand is this was given to us by some people that DeForest had, but this is DeForest here working away in one of his rooms uh, as, he, as he went about building the designs that, he, that Eastman would like to have on the garden. This here, and it's a tough one to see, this is a very detailed drawing. This was the final drawing for the gardens in 1903. It does list their separate documentation that goes with it, that lists all the different plants that were gonna be in there. They're a little tough to see, but all the little scribbling black marks you see actually denote the type of plant there was gonna be, uh, where he was gonna put it. You now can see here where the mansion's going to be, the main gardens for the terrace, where his greenhouses were going to be, his stable. They knew where the barn was gonna be. So this was the final drawing for just the landscape. This is what he was gonna have done. So now he's got all his drawings done. They know where they're gonna go. Now it's time to implement his plan. Now these are pictures where they start taking apart the property that he purchased. Culvers are gone. There were a lot of elm trees that Eastman desired to keep. So this was how they were gonna start moving them. And this is a really neat way of doing it where they actually make a large root ball and they put it on like a tipping table. They, you can see the gentleman is in the tree putting enough weight in there to tip it down and then it's attached to horses. <clears throat> Bit of a side note, the house you see in the background, that is the Ross property. That would be the house and property that Eastman buys in, in 1915 when he goes to expand his property. So you can see here now the tree is getting attached to the horse. The tree is now being moved to where he wants it to and stood right back up. Very ingenious ways of moving trees back then. Um, when we first came across some of these, I was amazed because I've seen the large trucks that do it. But just think about how they did it with horse and buggy. That's a whole other story. And what they did is they pulled all those trees out and they put them out towards where the what we call the vista or the east lawn now. 
and they actually replanted them. What you see, the boxes around them are there to make sure that nobody would bang into them with any kind of equipment, horses, trailers, whatever, and make sure that those trees were able to do it. And then they went into the building of the property. Here you can see some original pictures of when they were actually doing the construction. The pile of debris you're looking at here is from all the outbuildings that were on the Culver homestead. They were destroyed, put, put into a big pile, and eventually that gets moved. And you can see the greenhouses are beginning to get built. He's got the scaffolding up. Most of the building is up. Now, none of this started until 1903. It took a year for him to get through his planning and to get things going. But it actually took a little over two years to get this whole property built and to be ready for Eastman to come through and move in with his, his mother and his servants. Here's a really good picture of that back porch I was telling you. You can see the port share up here, and you can see this back porch. This back porch now, all of this stops, and this is where the Dryden is. So it's something that most people don't get to see. It was a utilitarian area of his property, so there aren't a lot of pictures of this area. This would have been where his garage was. It's actually just in front of where the stables would be. And it was something that, when it comes to pictures, we don't have a lot of documentation on it. We keep looking, we keep searching to try and find as much as we can. And we hopefully get across the right pictures to, to be able to do presentations or show people how this actually went. Here is a picture of the barn. Looking, We're looking north now towards University Avenue. This was the first completed building on the property. They were able to get the barn put up. And that at that point was towards the end of 1903. So there was a long ways to go. You can still see that this, the picture to the right there isn't a lot of stuff that's been done in that back area. The rock garden hasn't been done. The, his gardens have not been put in yet. So it was still very early in the process. Here the greenhouses are just about being completed. The glass is getting ready to be put in. And these were already attached to a wall. Um, at this point, the wall they are attaching to is going to be part of the, the blueprints that Sarah goes through. And we can point those out to you once those prints are up as to where they ended up being attached. As they're doing the, the east side of the property, building up that east porch. You can see a lot of the trees that are there. You can see a lot of the structure is actually in place, but there's windows missing. Um, and there were windows missing for a while. They actually had trouble getting windows to put in here. They're building the terrace garden at the same time. You can see some things are in, some things are up. You can see that, that pile of debris that's still sitting there. Some things neat to notate is the wellheads aren't there. He actually had put some bird baths in those center places, and he hadn't determined at this point, even in the middle of construction, what he was going to do around the pond. He had some benches here. If you look close enough, you can see these are different types of steps. So some of those decisions hadn't been made yet, and they were almost, you know, this is 2000 or 1904. They're real close to being completed with the structure but they're still making those last minute changes. And anybody who's ever done building knows as you get into it, you do have those kind of problems. Interesting things to note, the Palm House, as you can see, was able to be wide open with the doors. It's tough to see, but there actually was a bed in here where he was planting plants. Um, he was gonna be using the Palm House along with the greenhouses to continue growing what plants he wanted. <clears throat> this is a great picture from the south, from the north looking south, and it is, one of the only pictures I have been able to find that actually shows the carriage house that we're talking about today. You can see the greenhouses are attached. There is a wall in here. There actually is a courtyard behind all of this in between. But this is the only picture we've been able to find that shows the, the building. One of the reasons why is it was a utilitarian area. You know, people take pictures of their house or inside of their house. You very seldom see a picture of their laundry room. That's the way he sort of looked at this. And this, is, was, this was one of those odd pictures we were able to find. I think they were taking more of the greenhouses and the gardens than they were of the carriage house. So we're up to 19, or 1905 at this point. We're towards the end of the, the season. And Eastman's finally able to move into his house. Now, as, I, as, the, as it's titled, it's, you know, the best laid plans. Most people like to take a look at their house. It's finished. They don't want to do much, but we already know that as time went on, Eastman didn't. So these plans that we have, these, these original blueprints show us some of the progressions of what happened. 1915, as I stated, he, he bought the property next door. 
And at that point realized after 15 years, his conservatory wasn't proper. He wanted to fix it. So what did he do? He cut the house in half and moved it nine feet. The feet that he was not, he was told was not gonna be able to do it. When he was done building his house with the property, rough estimates were about 350 to $400,000 to build this whole property. Just to do this next move he did, they said was $750,000 and wasn't gonna happen. So he cut the house right in half and moved it. So those best laid plans, all that planning he did ahead of time, after things were done, they realized things didn't necessarily go the way they are, or they he wanted. Now, one of the pictures I did find that I've never seen before is this one. <clears throat> this is actually in 1950 when they were building the Curtis Theater. And this is where the plans that Sarah Ree did became very important because they were building on to the actual structure that Eastman had built originally. So these plans always keep coming back and helping out throughout history as, as more progress is done on the building or to find out where things are. It's a very strange picture because most people have never seen this. This wall here is where the Dryden Theater sits today. So you would never have seen this unless you were here in the 50s. Now, this picture here, this is the only picture we have of inside the courtyard of the carriage house. We have no other picture that's inside of it. And here what you see is his watchman with his dog, Hero. Yes, that's a German shepherd trying to climb over a nine foot wall. Um, I love it just because it shows that, but it also shows some of the things behind it. You can see what we call the potting shed at this point, the, what was the tool room originally put in there. And there was a wall to actually bring the horses out onto Archive Drive, which is here. So at this point, there's the history of how they did it. I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah so that she can show you all the things that went into taking care of the, the blueprints to bring them back into good shape and so that we will have them for future use. So Sarah, take it away. All right, let me um, share my screen here. And so I'm picking up where Dan had left off with uh, the blueprint itself. And that's really, um, it was really helpful for me to see because, um, let me share this slideshow, because I'm relatively new here to the Eastman Museum. I just started here January of last year. So getting to know the property during a pandemic was kind of difficult to do. And so being able to see these blueprints and discuss it with Dan um, really gave me an introduction to the property and its evolution. So this is the overall view of the blueprint that was brought to me. Um, in fact, it was waiting for me in the conservation lab. Uh, Kathy Connor, the legacy curator, and um, had brought these to the conservation lab because as you can see, there's quite a few tears. Um, and there's a lot of creases. And so she wanted to have them treated, have them you know, preserved in a better fashion than they are right now. So I will take you a little tour around what we're looking at. This is about 34 and and a half inches wide by 22 inches tall to give you um, an idea of the scale. I know it's kind of hard to see when it's on your full screen. It is carriage house stable and greenhouses, which as Dan said, there's not a lot of photographic documentation. So to see these drawings is really helpful, not only for uh, Dan, but for Kathy and for other people who are either researching the property or the architect, for example. So these would have been used to determine what materials go where, what's the scale, what type of gate, what size of gate, what, there's even a little cutaway you can see inside the building. They're really useful objects. But now, as we're looking at it here in 2021, it's no longer um, a, a reference document in the same way it would have been in 1903. It's, it's more um, significant as a historic understanding of the museum, of the mansion, of the property, as Dan said. So we're using them in a different way. Um, typically, these type of blueprints would have been used just to, to approve the, the scale drawing, approve the materials that we're using, and used during building and then discarded. But we have them now and we want to keep them. We want to keep them as a part of history of the museum and the mansion and use them 
for reference in a totally different way. They're not disposable the way they would have been now. And Dan in particular was interested in this shot, this West view, um, because again, he said this is a utilitarian building. There's not a lot of photographic documentation of it. And we have no way of knowing without photographic evidence that this was actually what was built, but it's the closest we can get to seeing this West view of, of the, the carriage house and stables, which is really wonderful. And again, as Dan had pointed out, this is the part of the greenhouse and the palm house, which for me was wonderful because I started here right as we were beginning the new museum's entrance, the Thomas Tischer Visitor Center, and the renovated cafe. And if you come to the museum now, this palm house is now where you can eat your lunch at the cafe. And so it was really nice for me to see this. But as you can see here, this is the before treatment state of the blueprint. There's a lot of tears that are misaligned. And that brings me to the conservation treatment. What am I going to do to help make this condition better than it is right now and make it last longer? And as a conservator, I'm not only thinking about the history of the object, what it's made of, how it was made, how it's been treated so far through its life, but also what are its physical, chemical, and chemical properties? What do I need to think about before I start a conservation treatment? So I'm gonna give you a little science lesson. Um, the blueprint is actually a photographic process, which is very fitting. We're a photography museum. George Eastman invented, obviously, Eastman Kodak. So we gotta talk a little bit about a photography process, which is the cyanotype. And that was presented in 1842 by John Herschel, who's pictured here. Can never forget John Herschel with his wonderful hat and haircut. And what was so wonderful about the cyanotype is that it was different from other photographic processes that were being investigated at the time. It wasn't silver based, um, silver gelatin, sil salted paper prints, all are silver based light sensitive salts. This one is iron based and it doesn't require a special darkroom or any specialized equipment. The chemistry is affordable and easily obtained because it's iron-based, iron being the second most abundant metal on the planet. And you can mix up the chemistry and coat it on pretty much any high quality paper that you have at home. So this made this photographic process so much easier and more widely available for people to use. And the reason it's so revolutionary is that it is um, ferric ferrous cyanide. It takes advantage of the fact that iron is a transition metal and iron can uh, exist in more than one oxidation state, meaning it's happy with a charge of two or happy with a charge of three. And you don't have to have a chemistry degree to understand this, but the, you need that difference in valence states, the iron two here in the center, as the uh, ferrous cyanide ion and the ferric ion over here because electrons that bounce between these two iron ions in the chemical compound are what give rise to that bright brilliant blue and so knowing that if i interrupt the chemical compound if i cause an, an oxidation or a reduction by adding something i can bleach this print um, if I add, for example, a buffered solution that has a high pH, I can cause an irreversible bleaching of the material. So I know I don't want to add anything like that, but fortunately, I don't have to. And this is a really great photographic process anyway. Um, it's really simple to do. And the only problem is if you have a buffered paper, for example, something with a high pH or like a calcium carbonate filler, you ever see buffered papers available for archives, you don't want to store cyanotypes with that because you may end up with some discoloration. Here's how you make a cyanotype. It starts with these two chemicals, uh, ferric ammonium citrate, which is kind of a greenish yellow, and potassium ferrous cyanide, which is orange. And you mix those in a water solution and you coat them on your paper. And then you Expose it to light with your negative or your specimen, or on our case, our blueprints, a black line drawing on a white paper in contact, contact print, in contact with the cyanotype paper or the blueprint paper. You expose it to light containing a UV source because the more energetic the light in the blue and UV region, 
you're going to induce that reaction quicker. And then you wash it in running water and let it dry. It's that simple. And by the 1870s, cyanotype papers were available commercially, pre-coated for you. The problem was that they were bright blue and people did not like this bright blue for their photographs. So even in early to um, mid, even the mid 20th century, blue prints weren't considered a high art photography in the history of photog photography, but they were super easy. All you needed was a negative, the sunlight in your backyard and some water and you could make images. So you see a lot of, you know, unattributed vernacular photography printed in cyanotypes like these ladies with their cats or uh, a letter to dear auntie. You could print it on a postcard and send it to your relatives and send them pictures the way that we text pictures to one another today. So even though it wasn't considered a high art, it was a great way to, to make prints if you weren't a, photo a professional photographer or have a darkroom access. It also made it a great photocopy process. As I said, all you'd have to do is have your black line architectural drawing on a white paper and you run it through a machine that exposes it to light and processes it and you get a blueprint and that's why they're called blueprints because they come out with this blue background wherever the light has struck the the blueprint paper or the cyanotype paper the light induces that chemical change to create the blue color and wherever it's protected from light with a black line drawing it stays white and you wash away those unexposed salts and you have your blueprint and as I said, it's very used as, as a reference document. This is now in raking light where the light goes across the surface and you can see there's lots of creases and folds. It was probably folded up or rolled. There's plenty of tears and those tears have been repaired on the back with lots of tape. So I know these are not really new. Um, this tape could have happened any time in its past, but the tape is beginning to discolor. So pressure, pressure sensitive tape, sort of like scotch tape. And what happens is that adhesive begins to age or oxidize and it can lose its adhesion or it can sink deeper into the paper. It can cause the paper to oxidize and discolor or the paper can oxidize and discolor and the tape can discolor. So I know that the treatment's gonna involve removing this tape before it continues aging and causes any more damage to the print and I need to do a better repair that's going to be more sympathetic to the paper. And here it is in raking light. There's a couple new tears happening over here and one that's going along the edge of the tape and I'll show a detail of that sooner. And now I'm going to switch my share and I'll show you a little video of the treatment. Let me know if everybody can see this. And this was filled by Nick Brandreth, our colleague. He's fantastic. So he was a big contribution to this. So with tape, it all depends on what type of tape and how old it is, what you do to remove it. Fortunately for this tape, I just needed to use a little bit of heat. And so this is a, a, a tool that we have. It's a hot air pencil. It blows a gentle, warm air stream at the tape to cause the adhesive to soften, and I'm using a tiny little spatula to pick up the tape carrier. And I think when I counted up, there was about 60 inches of tears. I don't think there were 60 inches of tape, but all told, there were 60 inches of tears to repair. So what I did is remove the carrier. Now I have um, a pickup eraser, and I'm removing any residual tacky adhesive. And it's coming up black because the back of the blueprint is dirty from use. This is vinyl eraser, which you're probably familiar with, just you know, erasing your own pencil mistakes. We grade it up into little pieces to increase the surface area and to make it a more gentle cleaning and pour it over the back and rub with our hands. And that removes the dirt without causing abrasion to the paper. And here I'm using a, the block eraser to sort of guide those crumbs, those eraser crumbs around. This is very sped up. This didn't happen this quickly. So I'm, now I'm cleaning the back because I don't want any dirt on the back of the, the blueprint when I go to add adhesive for my own repairs. So um, next, I have the blueprint again, face down, and I am using wheat starch paste 
and a Japanese tissue, which is made from mulberry fibers. It's a thin paper with very long paper fibers, so it's thin and strong. It's gonna really keep those tears from opening back up, but it's also not too strong, where if something does happen to the blueprint, that repair paper will tear. So I apply my, my repairs with the Japanese tissue and the wheat starch paste, and I dry it under weight because I don't want, as it dries, the paper to distort. So that's what you're seeing. It's blotting paper with a, a cardboard and a, a weight on top of it. This was the most problematic area. When you took all the tape off, it came off into pieces, several pieces. So it's, it's like doing a conservation puzzle. It's kind of, I enjoy it. You have to enjoy this kind of thing to do this career. <laughs> but you get to put it back together. Um, and after it was all dry and repaired on the back, I get to turn it over and see what the front looks like. And um, the most difficult part was realigning a lot of those overlapping tears. They were often overlapped in the wrong way where they were torn with a, a big overlap. And so they were misaligned. And then lastly, this was not necessary, but it really helped to, to get some visibility back to some of the areas where there was text. I'm using watercolor and a very fine brush to do some retouching or spotting along some of the tears that had some losses along the edge. And so there's the before and our after. And um, Nick made that look very easy and very quick. He compressed um, 35 hours of treatment into three and a half minutes. So I'm sure I'll get lots of questions about that. <laughs> um, and let me share here. I'll go back and show you some details now. Um, hang with me. I am working on my technology skills. Okay. There we go. So the edge of that print that had the pieces I was piecing back together in the video. You can really see here, there's one tear that's taped and this new tear here. And in raking light where the light is showing across the surface, you, here you can really see how that tear came along the tape. And um, I'll just give you a little view. So this is the before, after, before state. And then after treatment, you can see all of my very fine thin Japanese tissue along the tears. Um, the tape did discolor the, the back of the blueprint. I didn't do any kind of stain reduction because it wasn't going to cause any more damage to the print once I removed the tape and the adhesive. And so here's the back after treatment, a detail, obviously. And what was really helpful is you can see here a lot of those overlaps, a lot of this little white area. Um, after treatment, a lot of that just had to realign it, put that white back behind the blue. The blue was underneath, the front was underneath the back, and the back was on top of the front. So removing the tape, realigning the tears, um, really helped to um, make it much more legible, especially here, this little area above the palm house to the top right, says C transverse section probably. Um, all of that text was there. So it was really satisfying to turn it over and see that. And again, here is a little raking light view of that. So you can really kind of understand what I'm talking about when I say um, the front and the back were overlapped in the wrong direction. It was really, um, really a lot less loss than I had anticipated. And now this will be able to be referenced for Dan and the rest of the team to really see what we're looking at. And that's, uh, that's the end of my treatment portion. So I guess if Dan wants to jump on, we can have a little conversation about um, how, how this has really kind of expanded our understanding and how he can use it in the future. Yeah, that was, that was interesting. I learned something, which is nice. Great, um, I'm glad. Yeah, one, one of the things that, I had not seen this until we started this process. I had never seen this blueprint in particular. And it was nice to see some of the utilitarian areas that, that did show up. Uh, we were able to see, we had known about some of these things and most of this area had never been seen. We did get a chance during the reconstruction we did with the new visitor center to actually get in and see some of the old doorways and some of the old areas that 
had never been seen, had been covered up, had been been dis, you know, dismantled. The garage doors, some of the doors, you see a set of stairs right in the center. We found the door to that, and that was going down into an area that was basically the boiler area. So it was fun to see some of this and see how they did it. Um, the, what Sarah was indicating, you see the center picture to the left, that grand arched door, yes. Uh, we have no proof that that was ever done. We have, we have no idea whether it was. The one picture I showed you towards the end does show a bit of that arch at the top, but we don't really know. It's so it's nice to see these and say, okay, he probably did do most of this, but without that photographic evidence, it's a little tougher. Um, and these, I know these prints were probably looked at when they went to start doing the, the new uh, entrance. It would have been impacted by some of the structure that was here. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if they did, but I would assume they had, did take a look at it. I know some of these were taken a look at when they did the uh, restoration in the 90s. So these, these old documents do come back and are used quite a bit. Now, basically, we would use most of this for tools, but for um, teaching. But I think it's great. I think it looks fantastic, Sarah. You did a great job on it. Thank you. So, um, yeah, um, like like you said, 1903. This has this red inscription down here. It says May 19th, 1903. Um, this could have been a finalized blueprint, a finalized drawing where it was signed off on and says, yes, this is what we're going to do. Or it could have been a draft to submit for approval and th things could have been changed. You know, change orders happen all the time on all construction projects these days. So it's really not, um, not something that we can know because as Dan said, we don't always have this photographic evidence, but um, we, can, we can assume that since we have these, it was pretty close. Yeah. Since well, we have them in the collection, it was pretty close to what he did. Recently, um, one of my volunteers, probably the best person I could have on a volunteer team, Andy Joss, completed using looking at all the letters Eastman had written back then that had concerns for the house and the construction, which gave us very firm dates on when certain things happened. I know when they finished the roof. I know when they started the bricks on the front. And so these are the kind of things that we can put all this older information together, the blueprints, the photographs, and the letters that Eastman was writing and Eastman was getting to give us a better understanding of really how things went on as he was building the, the estate. So uh, without people that are willing to go and look into these things, uh, we'd, be, we'd be in pretty tough shape trying to figure out what Eastman did. Um, so I, I really want to put a good shout out to Andy because without his help on some of this, um, these kind of presentations and this kind of information wouldn't even be known. And it's, it's really fortunate that we have these pieces, right? Like most, most mansions or historic properties today, they may not even have um, the blueprints available because usually they were used and discarded. Yeah. Um, so we're really fortunate to have this, this as part of the, the legacy of the museum. Sarah, if, if you, if you, and Dan, if you don't mind me uh, stepping in now and starting the q and it seems like we're, we're at that point. Um, how do you determine what objects you're going to, I guess this is a question for Sarah, how do you determine what objects from the collections that you are going to receive conservation treatments? You know, obviously there's multiple different collections at the museum. Um, so how, how does that uh, process uh, begin? That's a really good question. Um, part of being a conservator is knowing what your specialty is and what your limits are. So I am a paper and a photo conservator. So I'm, I am qualified and comfortable treating photographs, prints, drawings, documents, that sort of thing. So if, um, for example, um, someone brought me some sort of uh, complicated camera from the technology collection, to repair, um, I might not be able to, to take that on because I feel like I'm not knowledgeable enough on that sort of material. But for um, anything within my specialty, photographs and paper, um, I can treat that. And usually it's up to the curator. So most of what we do here at the museum, my colleague Tina Miller and I, um, we are pretty much servicing the Department of Photography. We have a very um, busy, Low, well, not 
this year we don't have a very busy loan schedule, but usually we have a very busy exhibition and loan schedule. So we're primarily reviewing objects or photographs that are being chosen for exhibition. We make sure they're stable for exhibition and we talk to the curator if there's anything um, physically or chemically or aesthetically um, lacking. And so that's, we have a discussion with the curator and things like repairing tears, we, we do as a standing maintenance. We don't need approval for that, but anything larger like, like this where I'm doing a major treatment, um, we usually discuss what we're going to do before and we propose the treatment based on the time and the schedule and the need of the piece. And for this, uh, curator Kathy Connor had brought this to the conservation lab for treatment. So um, she's the one who asked for the treatment and I had the time and, uh, and we also wanted to do it for, for this, for outreach, for talks and for reference. So that's, that's usually how the decisions are made. Great. Um, Ken, Ken Frederick had asked, do the original black and white architectural drawings still exist? Ooh. Um, probably not. I know we do have all the blueprints upstairs in the house, um, but I don't believe the black ones would have been kept because once you had printed them to cyanotype, there was no need to hold them. Yeah. Yeah. The, they probably belonged to the architect's firm. Um, they might still be the firm, the architect's firm, if, if the architect's be. firm still exists in some, in uh, some be. fashion, but yeah. yeah. Uh, the nice thing about this, I will add, is that this is a one-to-one -one copy because they're printed in contact with one another. So there's no scale difference from the original drawing to the, the blueprint. Yeah. Do, do you know where the, blue, uh, the blueprint was found? Uh, was it in the mansion, architect's office? Uh, Joey Tarbell is asking. That's an interesting question. Um, I do know that they're all located upstairs in the uh, Eastman Legacy archives. Um, chances are they probably were found here. I'm guessing he had a lot of this that was kept. He was notorious for keeping all his letters, invoices, everything he dealt with. Um, so I'd probably bet that we actually found them here. By the time, you, you have to remember that by the time it became a museum, um, Eastman had been gone for 30 years. It had gone to the U of R. So that's actually quite, I can find out and see if I can get that information out there. Yeah, uh, be good to find out. I do know that the, red, the record in our cataloging system says gift of Eastman Kodak Company. But as Dan said, a lot of that stuff went to U of R, a lot of it went to Kodak. And then when the museum was founded, a lot of it came back and is listed as gifts of those those different organizations. So I, I don't know particularly where they there you go. were kept. I, I wasn't aware of that fact. So chances are they did come from Kodak. Yeah. Um, Sarah, Seth Irwin uh, has a question for you. Well, first Seth said thanks to you <laughs> and Dan for the wonderful talk. Um, and then uh, Seth's question is about light stability of blueprints. Uh, he says, we have lots of these at the Indiana State Library, and I get asked this a lot. Does the Eastman House have any recommended lighting restriction for exhibiting and storing blueprints to prevent fading? Do you have guidelines for how long blueprints can be, can safely be out for, um, excuse me, how long blueprints can safely be out for under normal lighting conditions? Oh, that is a tough question. Um, here at Eastman Museum, we have different guidelines on the maximum light levels and the maximum length of exhibition for all different photographic processes. Um, typically, we like to have lower light levels because most photographic processes are inherently light sensitive because that's how they were designed to be, you know, a light sensitive material, photography on view um, any light exposure is cumulative um, and irreversible, but for, for cyanotypes, remember I was talking about that iron two and iron three electron transfer. What's really interesting is if you have them on view for a long time, they cumulatively add up enough light energy exposure that they can start to fade. 
But what is also fascinating is when you take them out of light and put them in the dark, they often recover their blue color once they are not exposed to light energy anymore. Um, there's a lot of research going on about do they recover the same amount of color they had before they're on view or not. But um, typically I would say somewhere around five foot candles or 50 lux is probably what I would recommend for these. Um, and like any photographic material, it should not be on permanent display. We usually recommend three to six months unless it's traveling for an ex exhibition. And then it's usually three to six months at each venue. And then after it comes back, we, um, we keep it off view for a while just to prolong its life. And how many venues do you typically allow? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Usually, I would say not an infinite number. I right. think most exhibitions are probably like two to four venues. Wouldn't you say, Nick, your exhibition? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, but I was just, I was putting myself in there. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, 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 I would say probably a year and a half to yeah. two years max um, between different venues. Uh, and then yeah, it gets its kind of rest after that. Yeah, and rest is kind of a, <laughs> a misleading term because yeah. it doesn't actually like rest. It's yeah, just like <laughs> nothing, happens, nothing good happens <laughs> during yeah. that time other than yeah. not being exposed. Yeah, we like, we like to stick to like around a year maximum. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, well, thank you all for coming. Dan and Sarah, thank you both for um, uh, presenting today. And this is all so fascinating. Um, I, I love, Dan, love when you show us these just so, such rare, there's always something new cropping up every time you, you, you uh, do a presentation and always love seeing these new views of the property and, Hopefully we can do something more with those in the future um, and integrate them into some uh, maybe future displays or presentations. Um, and Sarah, thank you so much for the conservation treatment and the great video and, and showing the amount of work that goes into these types of treatments. As you said, what, 36 hours? Yeah, um, about that. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, and that's just one object and there are, you know, over 400,000 objects just in the photography collection. And, and uh, you know, that's just one of the collections at the museum. So it, it definitely is a process. It takes time and, and it, and, and we got get to things as we can. So yep, it's always um, case by case basis for everything. How long does it go on view? It depends. Yeah. yeah. Does it need treatment? It depends. Like we, we kind of customize everything to everything we approach. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to thank Dan for taking time out of his busy garden schedule to do yeah, this talk. Right. Um, and Deep our season. photographer, Liz, for taking such fantastic photos of the blueprint. Yeah. Yeah, thank you all. And thank you all for joining us. Um, our next webinar is next week on Thursday evening, the 27th uh, at 6 p.m. We're going to have a live uh, virtual artist talk uh, with uh, Stacy Steers, whose exhibition is currently on view in the Project Gallery. Uh, she'll actually be uh, streaming live from the gallery in conversation with the curator, Gordon Nelson. Uh, so really looking forward to uh, hearing them talk about that show. You can find uh, a link to that on our website to register if you'd like to. And I uh, hope to see you all again, uh, virtually or in person, uh, soon. Take care, everybody. Take care.